Hello, and welcome to the Games We Play podcast. I am your host, Brian Brindley, where we dissect the latest sports news, all about the games that we play. And today we have a pretty cohesive set of topics. We're going to be talking Andrew Luck, uh, the shocking retirement that happened over the weekend, and how his decision has affected the national conversation around multiple other subjects, both of which that we will address in this episode. So without that, with all that out of the way, let's just get into it. So Andrew Luck announced on Saturday that he was going to retire from the game of football. He's been a quarterback for the Indianapolis Colts for multiple years, a career 60.8% completion percentage, over 23,000 yards in his career, and over and 171 touchdowns in his career. Um, uh, he has taken the Colts to an AFC championship game where they lost to the Patriots and has taken them on multiple playoff runs. Uh, he was the most touted high school quarterback. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. College quarterback prospect that apparently has been around for the last at least decade or 20 years. I believe they said John Elway was the comp when he was coming out of college, uh, when it comes to expectations. And now there's Trevor Lawrence out of Clemson, who's getting a lot of hype and is kind of on a similar level, being put on a similar pedestal. But uh, at least to my knowledge, I'd never seen a quarterback that was that highly touted uh, as compared to Andrew Luck when he was coming out of college. So I found out the news. I was enjoying a birthday celebration for a good friend of mine. Uh, We went to the pool and we were swimming. We're having a good time. And then we went back to her place so that we could. There was a big party of a bunch of us and we were all going to change all gonna shower and change so that we could look nice look dapper so that we could go to her birthday dinner and as i was waiting for my turn in the shower i'm on my phone twiddling around looking up what's happening and i get an espn alert and it says that andrew luck is retiring from the nfl from adam schefter and at first i was like there's no way i was like there's no way i'm reading this right and then i hear from the other room somebody else yell oh my god and i was like wow i'm not just seeing things it's it's real he's really retiring so take my shower, go to the birthday dinner, and then I see the press conference on TV while I'm at dinner because it's up on the TV above the bar. And I can't hear what's going on because there's live music going on. Uh, but I can see in his face that he is – he doesn't look well. He looks pretty downtrodden. He looks he looks upset. He looks emotional. And that I completely understand, obviously. You're retiring from the game that you love. Um, it would be – great if he could continue to play but I assumed because I didn't really know much about it I remember a few weeks earlier uh, I believe he was talking in an interview about how when he was actually hurt and had to stay home it helped fix his relationship with his wife I don't know if she was his wife at the time uh, when he was talking about this but that's kind of what I thought in the vein of what it was going to be and I was mostly right I watched the press conference the next morning um I watched it with audio and he talked about how it was just he wasn't he didn't have the love for the game that he once did which is crazy because as multiple people in the media have brought up this is a guy who was touted because in part he was such a hard worker and he loved the game so much um I think it's a real shame that his injuries and his struggles to go through rehab over and over again because listen this is a guy with let's just list the injuries um missed he missed the 2017 season due to injury like the entire thing if you go on pro football reference his name is not on there uh he has had a concussion torn cartilage in his ribs he played with a lacerated kidney which apparently had him urinating blood because of that and now this ankle slash calf injury that we don't really have any definitive word on what exactly it ended up being um it's believed i believe to be a high ankle sprain um but in shocking fashion he just retires um the rest of the story around it is Schefter broke the news during a Colts preseason game that Andrew Luck was on the sidelines for and uh apparently he was going to address the media in a press conference the next day I believe he said but that all got thrown into a giant frenzy when Schefter got word of it and he reported it uh and so he had to call an emergency press conference after the game and that's where that's the press conference that I'm discussing now. Um, when I actually listened to what he said, uh, I could hear in his voice that 
he had a passion for the game and it's gone. He listed multiple different players that he played with and talked about very specific and very personal stories about them and how they helped him develop not just as a football player but as a man. And that's something that has been common in the coverage of Andrew Luck that I've seen is that he is he is a man before a football player that I can see. Uh, he seems like he built genuine friendships with these people. It seems like he's genuinely going to miss the camaraderie that he has on the field with the players. He's going to miss the game, obviously, but it feels a lot more personal than just a decision to retire due to injury. He said he's lost the passion for the game that he once had because this whole getting injured and trying to rehab, getting injured, trying to rehab, that thing is, it's a tough beast, especially when you are, when you know the skill that you have and you know the love you have for the game, but having to constantly be tempted by that love and then having it taken away because of injury, I'm sure that that's devastating and I feel for him. And I will quickly address the obvious terrible take of the week with that Doug Gottlieb of uh, FS1 had when, you know, he he made a joke and I understand that it's probably a joke, but all good jokes contain true-ish or to J. Cole um, and Doug Gottlieb that is within his wheelhouse that's the thing that I didn't like about the tweet is the next the next Monday he went on the air and he talked about he's like oh I'm a smart ass all this stuff but when when a joke like that is made and that's kind of your repertoire is to kind of bash on millennials and to you know just the tweet for those of you that don't know I don't remember the exact tweet I'm not going to pull it up but basically he said like retiring because injury rehab is too hard is the most millennial thing ever um and then he defended it by saying that he's comparing it to alex smith i believe which is a completely different scenario and i don't understand just because they're both injured quarterbacks that are one's coming back and one's not how does that correlate i I just don't see the comparison myself but there were people that were reacting like that and with the other negative reaction was obviously the Colts fans that are booing him coming off the field. Now, do I think that those Colts fans are should be disgraced for doing that? I think that they should feel disappointed in themselves, and I think that it is within the right of fans of the game and fans of Andrew Luck to be upset about that. I don't think that it's a reflection of all Colts fans. It's the same thing. I didn't think that when the Toronto Raptors fans were cheering after Kevin Durant uh, was injured. I don't think that's a reflection of all Raptors fans. I think that, especially in fan bases, it's all on an individual level. And I don't like the excuses that some are giving that, oh, they're boozed up and they're at a game and they're super into it. I'm like, it's a preseason game. Okay, you're going to be boozed up. You're going to be having a good time probably. But even then, since when has being boozed up been an excuse for your actions for the most part? I think in almost actually i'd say in every sense if you're boozed up that what you're saying or what you're doing at least reflects something in you that wants to do that whether or not that's something that you would excuse me whether or not that's something that you would normally do doesn't matter it's something that's within you and listen i'm not saying that if it happened to me that i might not react that way i don't know because i've never been in a situation where a team that i root for has had their star player just retire out of nowhere and seemingly just kind of lost their love for the game and done it two weeks before the season starts. But what I kind of want to discuss more with Andrew Luck is really just appreciating what I saw in that press conference, what I've seen throughout his career. Um, He's a good dude, man. And this is a really, really sad occasion because I have been a pretty ardent defender of Andrew Luck. I think that he got a really bad rap I think he was saddled with horrific management in the beginning of his career that refused to give him the help that he needed just wanted a bunch of skill players for him to throw to so he could rack up I think what it boils down to is they wanted him to rack up touchdowns especially passing touchdowns even wanted him to go on the ground a little bit because they were moving on from Peyton Manning and they wanted it to seem like we're making the right decision by moving off of Peyton Manning because it was somewhat controversial at the time uh, Peyton Manning was not done with his career. Yes, he was injured, and and yes, like Andrew Luck is the more future savvy quarterback. It makes more of a sense to bet on him as your franchise quarterback than bringing back Peyton Manning. But 
Indianapolis Colts fans really loved Peyton Manning, and there was some there was a rift in the fan base of people that might want to keep him coming or some people that wanted Andrew Luck to come in. So I think what they wanted to do is they wanted to bolster his performances as much as possible with the best skills players that he could have. Pardon me. Um, because if he can throw all these touchdown passes and start breaking these passing records, then that'll make the naysayers probably jump on board a little bit sooner. And he had good receivers in his stable because there were trades made, there were draft selections made throughout the years that really set him up with good skills players but an offensive line is uber important I think that that is evident in the NFL today even though they don't get a lot of love from the average viewer of football you might not know who the left tackle for the Buccaneers is off the top of your head but you know who Jameis Winston is and you know who Deshaun Jackson is so it's just kind of the territory of the game I feel really bad for Andrew Luck I wish him the best in retirement. I hope that he gets right mentally because he does not look like he is right mentally, at least not from that press conference. It looks like he is he is emotionally hurt. It looks like he is a man who is trying to figure out what his passion will become now, and I just wish him the best of luck. And again, just such a waste of talent, I think, by Colts mismanagement. Um, and that he's a player that was on the track to become a Hall of Famer one day, and... Now he's not even going to be in the Hall of Fame, which is insanity. Um, but best of luck to him in his retirement. Uh, I fully stand by his decision because, you know, it's his decision. If he wants to do that, he should do that. And, you know, I think we should congratulate him and not ridicule him for being soft. I think that's ridiculous. And speaking of his retirement, we could transition into topic number two. Um, as we know, Robert Gronkowski, tight end for the Patriots, walked away from the game this summer. And... Uh, even a couple years, even a few years back, Calvin Johnson retires, and all three of these guys, Andrew Luck, Rob Gronkowski, Calvin Johnson, all have in common that they retired relatively early in their life, especially in their football life. Robert Gronkowski looked like a broken player last year. I remember just seeing him, and he looked awful. He looked slow. He looked sluggish. He didn't seem like he had that same fire, that same tenacity that he had when he first came in the league. Obviously, off the field, Gronk is a... F- a spark plug but even even then in that in these this recent press run he's doing for his like cbd campaign to get it into athletics more he just doesn't have the same fire that he once had and it's kind of it's kind of sad to tell you the truth um and then obviously andrew luck in his press conference talks about love of the game and you know kind of losing it over time because of injury and everything and then calvin johnson was just a case of being stuck on terrible teams for so long and probably just being at his mental break and just saying, I don't want to do this anymore. And so is this a worrying trend for the NFL that they're having star players like this over the last half of a decade retiring relatively early in their career? I don't think it's going to become a general trend like some people are suggesting. I think that what it says is that teams need to be really really careful to keep their stars happy and I think that this comes in I guess in tandem with the trend of athletes being empowered in sports over their management and I think that overall that's a great thing because now that athletes in today's age have basically really kicked down the door between themselves in the front office and being able to communicate directly with the higher ups and saying, Hey, I want to play with this player. I want this. I want this. I want that. If you're a good enough player, I think that that's great that you have that kind of power. And I think that in the case of like an Andrew Luck, for example, one of the things that he was criticized for was not really being vocal about what he wanted with the media. And I think that's just his personality type. He was very, He was very team player. He was very, I am a part of the team. You could tell that in his press conference by how he talked about his teammates. He barely talked about his own accomplishments. I don't think he really did that much. He really was talking about how much he's going to miss his teammates. He wanted to come back to the game. He said to throw the ball to T.Y. Hilton. That's what he said. He said when he was coming back from injury after 2017, he was like, why do I want to play? And he said, I want to throw the ball to T.Y. Hilton. He didn't say... I want to win the championship. I want to I want to set this record. I want to throw the ball to T.Y. Hilton because I love watching T.Y. Hilton play. He's the best player I've ever played with. 
And because of that attitude, he couldn't really go to management and say like, hey, these receivers you're giving me are great, but I need protection from the offensive line because I'm getting killed out there every day. I think that another pl- I think that players like Antonio Brown, for example, Le'Veon Bell, LeBron James, even in the NBA, they get all this hatred and all this sort of sneering and sniding from people because they know what they want and they know what they need to succeed. And I think that as an individual, you know what's best for you. And I've always thought that. I think that if you you know what's better for you than anybody else, I think anybody would probably agree with that for the most part. There's obviously extreme, extreme circumstances where that's not true. But for the most part, I think that as an athlete especially who knows the game, somebody as smart as Andrew Luck, somebody as skilled as Calvin Johnson, somebody is as skilled as Robert Gronkowski. You know what you need and you know what you want, and they are able to walk away from the game also because they have outside deals. Rob Gronkowski, for example, he is a marketing machine. He can make his money outside of football, which is imperative in this situation. Back in the day, maybe 20, 30 years ago, sure, you're marketable as an athlete if you're one of the very best, like you are the face of the Dallas Cowboys, for example. Troy Aikman, you're probably going to be a pretty marketable face. But I'd even argue that somebody that's a great quarterback on a team that doesn't get that much media attention back 20, 30 years ago wouldn't be able to have the kind of marketing or, I guess, mogul-type personality or clout that they could really move on from the game of football and be fine. You would probably tough out the last few years of your career, even if you didn't really want to play and you didn't feel comfortable because, well, this is where I'm going to make my money. But a guy like Rob Gronkowski is such a face that he can make money whether he's playing football or not. That's evidence that he's still getting on Good Morning America even after he's retired. You got, excuse me, you have Michael Strahan hosting that Good Morning America. So there is obviously examples of like players that went into commentary and everything but it's it's more it's more likely that you are going to be able to make your own money outside of football as a player now and I think that that's part of the reason that we're seeing this trend a little more often than we were before and I think that that's overall great because while I love the game of football and I want the great players to play as long as they possibly can at the end of the day I'd rather see players doing playing the game of football because they love the game of football not because they need to make money And I know that obviously most players are playing for the money and that's, that's fair, obviously, but I think it's gotta be, we talked about it on the last episode. There is a meeting, there's a meeting point. I'd like it to be, you want to play football and you need money. That should be the ideal crossing point. And once you need the money more than you want to play football, if you have the ability to go out and make your own money doing something else, absolutely. I would be fine with it. Even as a fan of a team if they decided to quit football, if it was going to make them happy, because the way I look at it is if you're a fan, you are a fan of what that person is doing for you. And if you appreciate what that person did for you, Andrew Luck, Andrew Luck got your team to multiple playoff positions, uh, got you to an AFC championship, kept you in solid contention and kept you in the national spotlight for years. I think that you owe it to him that when he wants to walk away from the game and say, no, I'm done, that you at least don't boo him off the field that you at least give him a tip of the cap and you send him off and you say, you know what, did everything that you could. You got a pretty bum situation with how management dealt with your offensive line. Best of luck to you in the future, man. And I really hope that you come back and, you know, you show your face every once in a while and say hi to the fans and whatnot, which I think Andrew Luck will do. He seems like a guy that's not going to just completely, like, start crapping on the Colts organization once once he leaves. But that's my thoughts on those matters. Um, and let's just transition to the last topic for today. Um, Washington Post article came out yesterday. Um, a, a headline is, High school sports participation drops for the first time in 30 years. Um, this is Jacob Bogage or Bogaji. I'm not quite sure how to say his name, but I will link it in the description below. Uh, and this is from the Washington Post. Uh, here is the quote. Here's a quoted part of the article. Is this part of a trend? In high schools, no. High school sports participation had increased 30 years in a row before the 2018 data was released on Tuesday. Consider that in 1988, only 1.84 million students participated in high school sports. 
That number has since increased by more than 300%. But in youth sports, there is a trend. The proportion of kids ages 6 to 12 who participate regularly in team sports keeps declining. In 2008, it was 45%. According to Aspen Institute Think Tank, in 2018, it was 38%. High school football participation continues to drop as concerns over cost and injuries persist. That's largely attributed attributable to crumbling youth sports infrastructure. Municipal recreational leagues are declining as parents push kids to chase college scholarships through more competitive teams and the increased cost to pay cost to play on travel or club squads. I do wonder if you're reaching the point that the youth participation declines are reaching the high school level, said John Solomon, editorial director at the Aspen Institute <coughs> excuse me, Sports and Society program. When you at younger levels are losing players because of steeper competition and cost, that's going to catch up to high schools at some point, end quote. This is a really interesting article. I suggest you guys give it a read because while I think that the headline is pretty misleading, um, I think that the larger point that the article makes is a really, really important one. I have experience in talking to parents of kids that play younger sports, that play sports at a younger age. Club sports are huge now. Travel teams are huge now. Uh, Parents are trying to get their kid at the highest level of play that they can by the earliest age possible because they have seen that in sports now it's very much, um, I wouldn't say easier, the contracts are getting bigger and they want their kid to be as good as possible, as early as possible so they can surpass the skill level of in baseball you want to be better than a Mike Trout. In football you want to be better than a Patrick Mahomes. You just you have these different examples of players, and these parents really are taking control of the kids especially, and the important thing there is, let me find it again, that's largely attributable to crumbling youth sports infrastructure. Municipal recreational leagues are declining as parents push kids to chase college scholarships through more competitive teams and the increased cost to play on travel or club squads. So it's really, if you want to play a sport, you got to play for a really good team. Uh, there's not like your little league that has six or seven teams of kids from all across the city anymore. It's a club team, two club teams, three club teams for the entire city, and it's tryout to make it on. And if you make it on, you got to pay a lot of money because you guys are going to California for a tournament. You guys are going to go to Washington, D.C. for a tournament. And I think that this is going to catch up to high schools at some point. I agree with John Solomon of the Aspen Institute Sports and Society program. Um, I also think that it has to do with, I did research, uh, I was going to do a podcast at one point discussing the trend in high school sports that parents are trying to make their kids single sport athletes more than multi-sport athletes, and in researching for that, that that was one of the causes was money because you have to buy equipment if you're going to play a sport. You got to pay to have them play on a travel team at some point because if they're going to be any good, they got to play against the best competition, and the best competition is in these leagues that have a, a paywall behind them. And what makes me sad about this is if that becomes the case, if having money is the only way to play when you're really young and you get through all this, what is going to happen, I think, are a couple things. Number one, you're going to experience a lot more burnout in the kids that are playing sports. You're going to get kids that are playing at a super high competitive level for multiple years before, you know, before they even hit high school, and they might just get sick of it. Um, I know a kid that I played little league with that was a great pitcher, and when he got to high school, he didn't even want to play baseball anymore. He wanted to play tennis because he had focused. His dad had made him make him focus so much on baseball that he just didn't really want to do it anymore and he had played tennis up till that point but not nearly at the same level of vigor that he had baseball and so he was like you know I think I'm just gonna stick with tennis I don't think that I I want to play baseball anymore and that's a shame because he was a really talented athlete even from a younger age and I'm sure he would I'm sure he would have been great in high school probably would have played in college to tell you the truth the other thing that's going to happen so first there's going to be that that burnout effect. The other thing that I'm afraid of is it's not going to give kids that come from a poor background the opportunity to be a great player. There's a lot of players in the MLB and the NBA and the NFL that come from really, really hard circumstances where they did not have the money that they could have played on a travel team. 
They would have. They played in little league. They played in in pee wee football at like a cheap league at the YMCA before, so they could learn the skills. And then they eventually got to junior high and high school, and they were able to play. But if you're going into high school and that's really your first opportunity to play, but there's been kids that are playing for, I don't know, four or five years before that, and there are they already are leaps and bounds ahead of you in skill level, it might discourage you and it might make you get out there and be like, man, I'm really behind and I don't know if I can catch up because. I'm four to five years behind and that might discourage them or it might discourage kids from even trying out at all because they're like, Oh, well these kids have been playing forever. I've barely been playing. I'd love to try it, but I just never got a chance. And that would be a damn shame because I think sports stories are so powerful. And I think especially the story of a young athlete who rises from poverty, who rises from poor circumstances and becomes a fantastic athlete. I think those are the best stories that we can tell in sports. Adversity is inherently interesting. And if we continue to make sports exclusive and try to and I, I get I get the inclination. You want kids to play at the highest level as early as they can. I get that. But the amount of money that you have to put towards this is bordering on ridiculous and it's getting worse because it's popping up everywhere. There's club teams everywhere and they got to travel and play other teams. And there's even recruiting battles in club teams. I saw it when I was playing club baseball, when I was a kid, there was people being recruited to this team. And then you had a coach that was in your little league that was like, Hey, we're actually coaching over here. Why don't you come play over here? And I really worry about this because it makes me worry about the future of high school sports and ergo college and professional sports. So, um, anything else? I actually think that that's going to do it for this episode. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, This is going to be it for the Games We Play podcast. Uh, If you like this episode, go ahead and like it. You can comment down below. Let me know what you thought about any of my thoughts on the topics or your thoughts on the topics. Do you think that this trend is just kind of a fluke for this year? Do you think that this could be worrying in the future for high school and youth athletes? What do you think about Andrew Luck's retirement? Do you agree with people bashing the Colts fans who booed him? Or do you think that they were justified in the way that he unveiled his retirement? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and everything else I talked about in this episode. You can suggest topics that you want me to talk about down below as well. Um, And if you really, really like this episode, the best way that you can help me out is giving it a share on Twitter, on Facebook, social media in general. I would love that if you guys could do that for me. Uh, obviously I'm open to suggestions for topics or critiques of the show. If you don't like how it looks, if you don't like something that's going on with the recording quality, if you, you know, any sort of suggestions, I would take all of them. Uh, thank you guys once again so much for giving this a listen. I've been your host, Brian Brindley, and I will see you guys next time. Have an awesome rest of your day.